Thank you for joining us for the Miami Valley Salute to Veterans. I am Cindy LaPointe Daffler, a volunteer host for the Miami Valley Communications Council. My husband was killed in Vietnam in 1969. He was posthumously awarded the Medal of Honor. Being around our veterans and talking with them, hearing their stories and their thoughts is my way of honoring my husband's legacy. We hope that hearing these memories from the veterans of our community will help us all better understand the dedication of those who served. Today we're talking with Ray Snedegar of Centerville, a U.S. Air Force veteran who served from 1958 to 1990. He will tell us his story of, the time, of his time in the military. Thank you for being here with us, Ray. Oh, I'm honored to be here. Okay, so first, I usually start with how, how did you come to go into the military and why, why did you pick the branch that you did? I originally was going to join the Marines when I was a junior in high school and my parents wouldn't sign the papers. They wanted me to graduate from high school. So I couldn't wait to get out of farming. My dad was a tenant farmer uh -huh. and I had done it my whole life. And and I tell people I went to Vietnam on my senior trip to get out of farming. Uh, <laughs> so I graduated in June. I had joined the military the Air Force, when I went down to join the Marines the second time, uh, they weren't taking anybody at that time. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I knew I didn't want to go in the Navy, and I wasn't sure I wanted to be in the Army. So I went over to the Air Force recruiter, and he put me on a delayed enlistment in April. So I didn't go in until August of 58, August 7th of 58. And so I went from there to basic training in uh, Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio. And from there, I got sent to Keesler Air Force Base in the security service to learn to be a radio intercept operator, basically uh, a spy to, to listen in to Russian and Chinese and anybody else that may be trying to do harm to us. Did you speak those languages? No, I, I did Morse code. Oh. Copying Morse code. Okay. And I was fortunate enough, I was stationed in Masawa, Japan, and uh, 1 May of 1960, I happened to be working that night, and I was monitoring Francis Gary Powers when he got shot down over Russia, because oh, I didn't yeah. know Francis Gary Powers. I didn't know him. I'm copying numbers and letters. I don't know anything. The analysts are ripping it off, and I knew something was going on. But I didn't find out too much later that, that that's who I was chasing that, that night. The, mm -hmm. the Russians, they were shooting at him. Uh, so I spent uh, almost three years in security service, rotated back to the U.S. I went to Strategic Air Command in Schilling Air Force Base, Kansas, and I knew that wasn't what I wanted to do. So I thought I wanted to be a police officer. So I applied based on an Air Force Times ad in California for the highway patrol. And they said, well, we like what we see here, but you have to be a resident of the state for 30 days. Well, I had a six month old child and a wife and there was no way I could leave Kansas and go to California and take a chance on a job. Mm -hmm. So I took a first-term reenlistment uh, choice to go to the air commandos in Florida, and that's where I cross-trained in to be a loadmaster and was flying the rest of my career. Now explain what a loadmaster is. Loadmaster is the guy that, uh, guy or gal that loads the cargo on the airplane, figures out the weight and balance to make sure it's balanced during the flight, takes care of any passengers are on board. Mm -hmm jumps paratroopers out the doors or out off the ramp, drops bundles to uh, people on the ground. So that was an exciting career. I loved that career. I'll bet. I loved that. Flying somewhere around the world every day. Well, what happened next? Uh, I, I was in the air commandos for then. I went to the loadmaster school. And in 19, I was, I transferred to Florida and Air Commandos in 62, September 62. And then I went to uh, Vietnam on my first tour in uh, May of 63. 
and uh, that was my first airplane crash. And I had I've survived three plane crashes in Vietnam. Oh my gosh! What was what was the circumstances around that? Well, the the aircraft commander, or the pilots, and the uh, flight mechanic had missed. During the night, somebody had planted a satchel charge in number one engine, and they had missed it on pre-flight. So when oh. we reached about 500 feet of altitude, it went off, and on the same side I was sitting on, and uh, shrapnel was coming through the airplane. And all. Anyway, we, we circled back around, couldn't get the gear up. Uh, we tried to make the runway, and the fuselage made the runway, but the gear did not. So we crashed on the runway doing 360s down the runway without foam on it or anything. Oh, my God. Uh, so I came back from that tour. I went back to Vietnam in 65. And uh, in the meantime, I'd been down to Grenada and uh, did some work down there. And then I went to Viet back to Vietnam in 65. That was my second airplane crash. I got shot down. The time. They shot you down. Yeah, huh? yeah. We were at a C forty seven. Both those first two crashes were the old DC three or Goonie Bird, and uh, we were dropping leaflets about fifty feet off the ground, and somebody sound sound like they stuck a machine gun inside the airplane. And oh, there was a rat a tat tat. I could see holes opening on the other side of the airplane. And I knew. I didn't think I was hit. Uh, my flight mechanic had got up and he fell to the floor. Uh, I thought he'd been shot. I was afraid to turn him over once we leveled off, but he had broken both legs when the pilots pulled the airplane up oh my God. at that time and broke both his ankles. Uh, but he wasn't shot either, but the airplane was badly damaged, and we crashed near an Army Special Forces camp, and they took us in for the night. And uh, so the enemy didn't get to us either time. So I was fortunate in those two. Yeah. Uh, I came back from Vietnam in 65, back to Florida. Then I transferred to England Air Force Base, Louisiana, to a training squadron. So I was training people to go to Vietnam. And I actually trained John Levito, who got the Medal of Honor uh, in Vietnam. I trained him to go over there as a loadmaster. And uh, after about four years there, I, I worked on a C-119 or AC-119 gunship program down in St. Augustine. And then I wound up going to Vietnam uh, again. I went to Taiwan, CCK. But they CCK? CCK, Ching Chang Kung Kang Air, Air Base in, in Taiwan. Wow. And uh, the U.S. could only have a certain number of military people in the, in the country, in the Vietnam. So they stationed us at outlying countries, and we spent most of the time in Vietnam flying. So I was flying 130s then, and I, I flew 130s for 15 months over there. And uh, I was working out of Tom Sleet. First time I was in Benoit, second time I was in uh, uh, Nha Trang, and the third time it was not Tom Sleet, it was Cameron Bay. I was flying out of there. Mm -hmm. So we spent 15 months doing that. Then I rotated back to the U.S. to Travis Air Force Base, California, and I spent uh, 11 years to the day on Travis. Wow. And then I got transferred here to Wright-Patterson. I wanted to come home. My parents were here. They were getting older, and I wanted to I come home, so I, an opening came up for me to go to air transportability and test loading out here at Wright-Pat. So I got that assignment, and I spent nine years, nine years here before I retired. Um, I was glad I came back. My mother passed away within nine months of me getting back here, and, and my dad had to be taken care of later, so I was glad I had transferred yeah. back here. Yeah. So I've had a, a really full career, and, and at Wright-Patterson and Air Transportability, I worked on all kinds of different projects. The Hubble Space Telescope, the USB and Space Command. Wow. Uh, uh, Space Lab. Uh, I picked up the MiG-25 when Viktor Belenko defected into Japan from Russia. And uh, so I got to do all those kind of projects out here at Wright-Patterson to see if they would fit in airplanes. Oh, my gosh. So I've had an illustrious career. <laughs> I just loved it. 
for an old farm boy out of Kentucky with no education. <laughs> and I got a, I got a, I wound up with a dual master's in the in the Air Force. So came in with a high school education, and I've had a wonderful life. Oh, wonderful life. That's great. And and your wife, uh, she traveled. Or she moved around with you well she was yeah she moved around with me the only place she was overseas with me was in as in japan in she, japan she spent she spent two years over there i brought her over and uh my first child was born in japan mm -hmm. uh, and then the last the second one was born in fort walton beach florida when i was in the air commandos and the third one was born at england air force base when i was in the training squad <laughs> well good Good. I came home just in time to get her pregnant, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. So she's she's good with Dayton then? Oh, no, she's passed away Oh, now. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, she passed away in uh, November 19th of 2011. Oh, my. And nothing wrong with her. Uh, just her brain kept disintegrating. She kept having aneurysms and aneurysms. Oh. So, I'm so sorry. Yeah. There's so much of that, and then she got Alzheimer's before she passed away. So yeah, that's an insidious disease. Yeah. It's awful. Oh my gosh. Yeah, but yeah, she loved the military life. She like me. She grew up poor, and we got to see the world. And yeah, yeah. Well, tell me about other experiences. Now, you you went into basic training. I don't know what they call it in the Air Force, but. Was that the first time you'd been away from home, or? Oh, I'd never been on an airplane before. <laughs> <laughs> well, you had all kinds of new experiences. I, I did. I just, did just doing that. First wow. time away from home. I mean, we had no money, so we didn't take vacations, and we didn't do anything like that. So I'd never been anywhere. Right. Well, how exciting. <laughs> <laughs> did you miss home, or or? Uh, when I was in basic training, I wanted to go home. I wanted my mother to come get me. <laughs> I would have walked out of there and wouldn't have been embarrassed. But uh, but now after a while, I, I grew accustomed to it. And we got home quite often. So, But I, I just love the military life. Yeah. Oh, that's great. And I had a great wife. She took care of the family, kept the household running. Mm -hmm. and raised the children. Raised the children. Packed up when it's time to move. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I had a perfect wife. Yes, yes, sounds like it. Are your children around here? Yes, they all live here. My son was living in California, but he had stayed out there when we came back. But he just moved back recently, uh -huh. and uh, he's now a security guard for the Schuster Center and the Victoria Theater, okay. so things like that. And the other two girls live in the area. Oh, that's nice. That's yeah. nice. Your kids are close by. And the grandkids are all here. How many? I have six grandkids <laughs> and uh, three great grandkids i have three children six grandkids and three great grandchildren okay okay good deal one of them's a newborn oh congratulations yeah, thank you so you were involved with the what what was it called the children um operation baby lift operation baby lift can you tell us about that yes um I go around the country speaking about that all the time now, and uh, it's it's odd to me that this this historical event is still uh, relevant, mm -hmm. and I think it's because the the kids that survived the crash uh, with, with me they they do a lot of talking about it. They have reunions. They're on TV all the time. They're they're kind of keeping it alive, and every year on April the 4th, every major TV channel has it on. Mm -hmm. They talk about it. Uh, usually history happens, and about 10 years later, we don't know anything about it anymore, but they keep kind of keep it alive. Uh, I was in the Philippines at the time. I had left home with this flight crew, and I had jumped off, and I was what they call a Czech airman, so I could jump from airplane to airplane and I had jumped off and went ahead of them and gave evaluations to other people um, I got to the Philippines and I was getting ready to go up to Japan then head back to, to California now what year was this 1975 okay and uh, on we had left home on April Fool's Day April 1st 
75. On April the 3rd, President Ford was speaking in San Diego at a conference, mm -hmm. and the rumor was that all of these children that had been fathered by Americans to Vietnamese mothers were going to be killed. Mm -hmm. you know? And President Ford decided he was going to, he named this thing Operation Baby Lift, and he made a speech that day and gave an executive order that we would go in and pick these children up, as many as we could get out of there. Now, it depends on what... Uh, publication you read, there's somewhere between 20,000 and 80,000 children fathered by Americans in that 10-year hmm. period. There, nobody knows the real number. Yeah. And uh, so he said we were going to go get them, and they were preparing back in the States, back in the U.S., to put seats in airplanes and do all kinds of different things. But somebody, and the way the military operates, uh, some general gets in brained idea. Well, I've got airplanes already out there, so let's just get started on this one quickly. <sighs> so people had asked me to go with them that day, and I said, no, nah, I've already been with you guys. I'm heading home. But they came back and told me they were going to test an infrared countermeasures unit on the airplane that day. So I went out there. Well, no sooner had I gotten out there than a lot of Big wigs, colonels, and staff cars started showing up, and I knew something was going on, but I didn't know what. So they came around asking, "Did anybody have any combat loading experience?" Well, you never volunteer, but I stuck my hand up, and because I was the only one on the crew that had combat loading experience, mm -hmm. I'd been in Vietnam before. So they said, "Come with me." So we go into this classified, big, sterile briefing room and get briefed to what's going to happen. And uh, they asked me, how many people, if you put them in the floor and put straps over them, how many people could you get in the airplane? I said, what am I carrying? So they said, we, we don't know. And I said, well, if I'm carrying Vietnamese babies out, I can probably get 2,000 on the airplane. Wow. And with the troop compartment upstairs with 75 seats up there and the cargo floor. And I said, if I'm carrying adults, it's probably going to be 1,200, you know, American adults. And if I'm carrying a mix of Vietnamese, Americans, and kids, maybe 1,500. So my aircraft commander said the number is 1,200. So that's the number they decided on. Uh, we were delayed taking off because there had to be a, a windshield had to be repaired. So we got delayed about three or four times there, and they were trying to crank us out of there. We finally got off, and well, they put a medical crew on with us, and uh, which was consists of two nurses and three medical technicians, um, and they put two combat photographers on to take pictures of this. They, it was a publicity mm -hmm. thing, you know. We should never have done this, but mm -hmm. um, we take off when we go over there. We've had five hundred cans of juice, five hundred cans of uh, five hundred cartons of milk, and. Uh, had them stored behind the troop compartment seats. And uh, we get to Saigon, and it's a total mess. It's chaos. It's just like you saw on TV for the Afghanistan thing. Mm -hmm. Same exact thing. Mm -hmm. um, they started bringing the kids out in little Volkswagen buses and vans and buses and trucks and everything. So I made the decision on who would go upstairs to the troop compartment and I, anybody that couldn't take care of themselves. And I had some polio victims on crutches, so I, I put them up there, and I put little babies up there. And I have 75 seats, 73 up there for pastures and two for loadmasters. I put 145 babies in 75 seats, and I have pictures of that. Um, so... Those most of those children survived. Uh, I put the ones that were larger uh, downstairs and put them on the catwalk or to put them to the floor. Uh, I put pillows over some of them, uh, put stretched cargo straps across them, and just set them on the floor. And uh, we took off, and well, we had trouble closing the door. And uh, to back up, when we before we left California, 
there is what they call a bell crank that controls the aft ramp, controls the locks on the ramp. Well, let's call us Airplane A. Airplane B needed a bell crank. At those days, we cannibalized parts, took parts off our airplanes and put on others. Mm -hmm. And that works most of the time. Well, there's other 10 airplanes sitting out there, maybe 15. They could have got the bell crank. They came to our airplane and got the bell crank off a good airplane that was loaded, put it on B. They go to airplane C and bring it back to us. Well, they found out bell cranks are not interchangeable that, in that accident. So anyway, every time they close the door, uh, they probably crack that bell crank uh, to so many thousand of an inch too short. We got the side guy, we opened up, and we unloaded 17 105 howitzers given to the Vietnamese. Cracked it again, had trouble closing it, recycled it four or five times, finally got the light, the indicator was closed, and cracked it even more. Mm. And uh, we finally got airborne, and 14 and a half minutes into the flight, at 23,800 feet, the back end blew off the airplane. Just oh and it cut the control cables, all the control cables to the airplane and two of the four hydraulic lines systems. So we had no control of the airplane except ailerons and, and power. And um, so to get the airplane, we were about 14 miles off the coast of uh, Vung Tau or Cape St. Jacques. And I got the airplane turned around and we were oscillating like 5,000 feet at a time. I was first time I've ever been scared in my life. Like then I knew I was going to die. I just knew it. Because first thing we did was when it kicked, when the back end blew off, it kicked the rudder end, and we started descending real quick on the left wing. And we went from twenty three eight to fourteen thousand before they recovered. And then they were flying it with power, power on, mm -hmm. oscillating five thousand feet at a time. We were doing pretty good at that until we put the gear down to turn to go to the runway, and then we airplane wouldn't fly. So the co-pilot yelled out to go wings level. So we went in. We we hit the first time at 329 miles an hour mm -hmm. on the first impact. Scrape took all 24 main tires off the airplane, left the nose gear on it, took part of the cargo bay out, took some people out at that time. Um we got airborne again and flew exactly across the Saigon River and landed on top of four Viet Cong soldiers. And that's, I was in real time up to that point. And then my mind went into slow motion. And I just, as the airplane got what I thought was standing tail straight up, I thought if it would just hurry up, I'd be, I'm okay. I'm still alive. And then I got to thinking, uh, you know, if you just stop, I'm okay. And But none of that happened. I, st I stayed in slow motion. And what had happened, the cockpit had broke off that I was riding in. The tail section came off. The wings flew off. And the troop compartment with the babies in it, with a lot of the babies in it, was skidding along the ground. And 144 of those 145 babies survived. Wow. Nobody survived downstairs. Mm -mm. And uh, it was a mess. It was a mess that day. And I got out of the airplane. And when I when I first realized what was going on, I'm hanging upside down, and I knew exactly where I was at. So I released my seatbelt, and I fell on my head. And I had already gotten a concussion for some of the debris hit me going by me in the airplane. And I had another concussion, and once I stood up, I was lost. I did not know where I was at that point. So I had seen some other crew members run out to the galley area, and I went out. I went right where the galley on the airplane ends. That was the end of the cockpit. That's where I, I stepped out into the swamp. And nightmare out there. Oh. And, and then we... I went over to help them evacuate the babies out of the airplane. And one of the nurses who just passed away March 27th from cancer, she was she had a broken back. So she was sitting down in the airplane in the troop car and passing the babies out. And we we rescued all of them. And one child died. They all had little 
like a little duffel bag around their neck with a safety pin attached to their shirt and a drawstring on it. Well, one of the kids, the drawstring, or the safety pin ripped out, choked the child to death. That's the only, oh. that, that troop bar was sliding. And I have pictures of, of all these kids in those. Uh, and that was the only child we lost up there. Now, we lost a couple of adults up there. I had 12 adults up there, load masters and medical crew and people like that, and just ladies flying with us, and uh, that they were evacuating out of the country. And we lost uh, two of them. I lost one of my load masters up there, and we lost uh, a lady who broke her back. Mm -hmm. uh, I have talked about this, and psychiatrists have said, we were talking earlier, you know, before we went on air, that people don't like to talk sometimes. Mm -hmm. well, they tell me that that was good, that I did talk, rather than keeping it bottled up, like mm -hmm. some people do. Um, and we have some people on the airplane who will not talk about it. Well, sure. Just won't. Uh, but I'm, I'm friends with so many of these children that survived. I, I go to reunions with them. I, I talk to one of them every day. Uh, there's so many success stories out of these, these children. You know, they were six months old, nine months old. And the, the, the real tragedy of this whole thing is we lost all the manifest and everything. So none of these children know what their name is. They don't know what their birthday is. Oh, they don't wow. know who they are. Uh, they don't know their parents. And uh, how they got out of the country was they didn't have passports, they didn't have birth certificates, they didn't have anything. They just dropped off on the street or dropped off in an orphanage. And uh, I have a friend who's in uh, lives in Colorado Springs, and she was away in the country five days, went over to adopt a baby. She named these kids. She took a Vietnamese phone book. The first name belongs to you, the second name belongs to me, the third name belongs to the next one. That's how they got their names. Oh, my gosh. So there's a scam going on now where some of these children think they found their mothers. They're not. Uh -uh. That's, that's not their name. That's not who they are. Uh, but anyway, just stop and think about that. If you don't know who you are, yeah. how old you are. And a doctor determined this one's six months old, that one, and the birthday is August 1st. Yeah. And then this friend of mine in uh, Colorado Springs, took the names out of a phone book. Mm -hmm. And that some of these children, it really bothers them. I, mean, I know four or five that they're really bothered by the fact they don't know who they are. Mm -hmm. I can understand that. Mm -hmm. But there's, there's a deputy sheriff out of that. There's a nuclear scientist, one, one of the men, Went to, uh, went to the Navy and worked on a nuclear sub, got out and went to school. He became a nuclear scientist. Oh, my gosh. I have another one that's in the, the iconic picture you see of President Ford carrying a baby off the airplane. That's, that's Nikki it. Logan. She lives in Grayson, Georgia. And uh, she now has just moved to right outside the University of Georgia. She's a celebrity. Uh, she was on Celebrity Chef and came in second. She's an executive chef now. She has her own restaurant oh my gosh. out of Georgia. So, so many success stories out of these kids. Oh, my gosh. They're so thankful. If you're just joining us, this is Miami Valley Communications Council Salute to Veterans podcast. I'm your host, Cindy LaPointe Daffler, and today we're talking with Ray, a veteran of the U.S. Air Force and involved with Operation Baby Lift. It's like, that, this is an incredible story, um, and, and the fact that there's so many of them that still get together. Oh, yeah. And that you know, and uh, so many successful, you know, success stories with them. I'm so proud of them. Yeah, yeah. Well, they, they must have found good homes, good parents. Some of them, I'd say the majority of them did, but we have two or three of them that I'm familiar with that did not have good homes oh. when they came here. That's sad. They took them for the money they were getting and things like that. Oh, it's about the money. Yeah. Yeah. 
Oh my gosh. And I have a real good friend that's like that. And her name is uh, Erin Lockhart. Terrible, terrible experience with her parents. In fact, her parents don't even get along with their own kids. You know, they don't even see their grandkids. But Erin graduated from uh, Virginia Tech. Uh, she then decided she wanted to go into government service. So she's been in government service her whole life. Her, her first assignment, I forget where she went the first one, then the second assignment was to uh, uh, Garmisch, Germany, the, the big army institute over there. And she stayed there 10 years. Oh, my. And uh, then she transferred back, and she went to work at a public affairs in uh, Texas and then San Angelo. Then she moved to San Antonio and went to work for a three-star general there. She's now the speechwriter for the Air Force Commandant at the Academy. Wow. <laughs> Talk about a success story, huh? And she's a single mom, adopted three little girls. Oh. Uh, living the dream. I guess. That's wonderful. Now, how old would she be now? And Aaron was nine months old then, and uh, she's 50, 49, 50. Mm-hmm. Wow. That's, that's great. And her name is Erin, A-R-Y-N. And the nun that got her adopted back in the States got killed in a crash with us. Oh. Uh, but there was a, a friend of hers by the name of, of uh, Carrie. Uh, no, Ryan. So that's a mixture of Ryan, A-R-Y-N is her name, Erin. I've never seen it spelled like that. Huh. That's great. <laughs> and we went back to Vietnam. She and I went back in 2014 and spent three weeks in a French villa over there and toured the country and went back to a lot of the orphanages that the, the kids had come out of it had asked us to go to. And uh, we went back to her orphanage, which is now a police station. We couldn't get into it. But she met a lady that worked there. So back it was then, out of, uh, back then, oh, okay, as, as, a, as a street vendor, and we have pictures of all of this too. But in the meantime, she went to Malaysia, where Sister Ursula, the nun, was buried, and oh. met her family. Oh, okay. So, she's she's a world traveler. She <laughs> she's just, a world traveler now. That's great. It was before she adopted adopted these kids, but mm -hmm. now she's full time mother. Oh. Okay. Well, you know, I've got questions from the past. <laughs> okay. But, you know, like your training and what happened, and you, you talked about that a little bit, um, and and where you took your advanced training. You already told us that. Um, what was the best part of your training, do you remember? Well, you know, you you were, grew up on a farm. Oh, yes. So you were probably used to some pretty hard work. Oh, yeah. And so That's going why I wanted into, out. <laughs> yeah. I've heard that. And and uh, when you went into your basic training, is that what they call it in the U.S. Yes. Air Force? Okay. When you went into your basic training, it was probably no big deal, it's right? No big deal. <laughs> I figured that. I hear that a lot. No. You know, it depends on how you grew up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What was the best part of your training? Uh, the fact that I was allowed to be an aviator, I think, oh. was the best part of it. Oh, that's great. I loved that. I, I, would, I would fly to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> I love flying. Oh, that's great. Yeah. That's great because, yeah, you, you got to do that, new experiences. That's great. Every day was a new new experience. Is there any instructor that kind of stands out in your mind from back then? Oh, yes. Uh, he he passed away here at Wright-Patterson. As a matter of fact, he was kind of like a mentor to me. Uh, he was he was my loadmaster instructor, and then he, he wound up later being my boss at, in a squadron. And his name is David Sampson, and okay. he passed away right here at Wright-Patterson. Oh, yeah, okay. yeah, he, he stood out. So you ended up in the same town. Mm -hmm. Doing the same job. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. So you were close to him oh, for yes. many years. Oh, yes, many years. Okay. I worked for him at Travis, and then I worked with him here at Wright-Patterson. 
how did these experiences change you? It matured me. I, I think I'm a proponent that every young person should go in the military to learn discipline and structure. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm a big person on structure now. I grew up without structure, basically. And uh, I, I just I'd love that. And I think young people want discipline. They want to be told what so to too. do. Mm-hmm. You know, that's when they get out of control. If nobody is is giving them that instruction or that structure, mm-hmm. um, I I just I just I just love the military and and the way it was. I'm not sure I like it now, but <laughs> but. Uh, it just it just made a, a better person out of me, and uh, the experience of the of the C five crash uh, was sobering. It's you know we can be gone any second, and up to that point, I never thought about that. Yeah, and uh, I lost a couple of dear friends. There was there was one guy on the airplane that I had specifically put on the airplane that day. Um, that's changes your whole life. Yeah, you know, it changes and your, your whole perspective. Life. Yeah. I often wonder like General Eisenhower and them, how do they live with themselves if they order people mm. like to go to Normandy and <laughs> I don't. I don't know how they do that, and because it's difficult. Sure, you got a lot of responsibility on your mind that you just directed somebody to do. Mm-hmm. So the military does that for you. Um, they give you the training and things you need, but sometimes the unexpected happens that you haven't had training for. Certainly, certainly. Did you have humorous events? Did oh yeah, there's a lot of funny fun. things happen. <laughs> Give us an example. <laughs> oh, even the day of the the uh, C five thing, it, this one load master, I was downstairs in a cargo environment. And he comes down and he says, uh, "Hey, uh, we're getting ready to the crash. Looks like." And he said, uh, "We need to go get our crash landing checklist." Well, I'm in standardization. I'm I'm the guy that writes all this stuff. So I said, good idea. So I go upstairs and I go in the bunk room where I'd stored all our briefcases and everything. And I pull my checklist out. And I'm flipping through the pages looking for my crash landing checklist. And all at once it dawned on me, there is no such thing as a crash landing checklist. <laughs> and I remember distinctly throwing it into the floor and just being disgusted with myself or even fallen for that mm-hmm. you know and he was he, he said we need to get it so I, I went to get it and uh, the other thing that was funny that day was humorous to me you have to take a, the table I was sitting at you have to take it out if you're ditching or crash landing and stow it and I'm bracing on it and the only thing I can think of is when somebody gets to this crash site I'm in charge of all these rules, and I didn't take this table out. Somebody's going to be really upset with me when they get to the crash site. You're worried about that. <laughs> yeah, I'm worried about that. My reputation, you know, and I'm heading toward death. And But that table saved my life. I braced on it so hard I broke it loose. It flew up and hit me in the head. That's one of the things that gave me a concussion, the debris kept hitting that table instead of you instead of me so those things that god speaks oh my gosh it, uh, what what was the best part of your service experience you have a best part or is it the whole thing <laughs> i think the whole thing was but my probably my most enjoyable experiences were in California for the nine years or 11 years I was there. I just had so many things I did and I flew around the world several times and I, that was so enjoyable to me. I just loved flying. So 
you were here in Dayton when your service ended? Yes. Your military service, and then you did what? I, I went to work for an airline flying again <laughs> in <laughs> Wilmington Cargo Airline, ABX Air. Oh, okay. Yeah, I flew there for 20 years. Okay. And I ran a department there. I was the director there of uh, uh, ground training and regulatory compliance. So you adjusted to civilian life mm -hmm. pretty well. Yes. That's great. And you, but you stayed, lived in Dayton, and stayed worked here. down there. Yeah, we couldn't leave. Yeah, we had grandkids here. The wife wasn't leaving. <laughs> yeah, well, and Wilmington's not that far. No. <laughs> Did you join a veteran organization? I belong to the American Legion, mm -hmm. and I get together. In fact, uh, yesterday I was with uh, a bunch of us veterans get together once a week down in Mason at a coffee shop every morning and. Uh, it once a week. Once a week. And uh, just reminisce and tell lies to each other. <laughs> <laughs> the, but other the than fish that, stories, right? Yeah. I never was big on joining organizations. Uh, well, you joined an organization that was pretty big. <laughs> yeah, I know. But, but like, uh, I belong to Airlift Tanker Association now. And they... And I joined it because they started asking me to make speeches there. Mm -hmm. and, then I, and I liked that organization. I belonged to the American Legion, but I, unless I was ordered to, I never belonged to the NCO club. You know, it just, I didn't have time to do sure. that. Mm -hmm. Just busy raising kids when I was home and trying to be with the kids. And yeah. and I knew she was doing the, the burn. The bulk of the burden. Oh, yeah, yeah. Do, do you keep in touch with the people you served with? Yes. Okay. Do you yeah. get together at all? Oh, yes. We have reunions that I go to. Okay. Uh, matter of fact, I got three of them this year. I got the Tactical Airlift reunion in San Antonio. Uh, I got the Loadmaster reunion. This is going to be in Fort Walton Beach, Florida. And uh, I got the Airlift Tanker Association. It's going to be in Grapevine, Texas this year, all three of those. That's great. That's great. And meet up with a lot of the people that I've worked with. What would you like people to remember from your story? That anybody can achieve what they want if they're willing to work for it. Mm -hmm. You know, here I was a high school graduate. I couldn't have went to a major college because the high school I went to yeah. didn't teach us anything. Right. <laughs> and uh, uh, we wound up in the military and wound, wound up with the highest rank possible. I got to spend 30, almost 32 years in there. Uh, got to see and do things. Got an associate degree, bachelor's degree, dual master's degree. You can, you can do it if you want to do it. Sure. That's that's great. I, I just like to be an example for people. I, uh, I, I like to share my story because I think if I can do it, anybody can do it. Yeah. But that's the way. It was it was an historical event that you went through. That yes. You went through. Yes. And. Uh, it's really important to keep that alive. Well, I don't keep, I don't think I keep it alive. I think it's these babies that, I mean, they're seeking answers. That's the main thing they're doing. Right, right. And they're probably never going to get some of these answers. Yeah. Now, I do have one friend, and I talk to her daily, actually. She lives in Mission Viejo, California. And uh, she uh, has found her father back here but he was deceased by the time she found him but uh it's been proven that's her father now DNA. she was five years old at the time she remembers everything about the crash i ran into her wow. in, in a reunion in uh, dana point california and uh, she walks up to me and her name tag on she said i was in a crash with you and i said uh, okay good you know chatted a little bit and she said i was five years old and i go no you weren't she said time out here you couldn't have been five years old 
She said, why? I said, I made a decision who went upstairs, who stayed downstairs. If you were five years old, I would have put you downstairs. She said, I was small, I was sickly, I was frail. Mm -hmm. But I saw a picture of her. I have a picture of her four days after the crash when she's in California. And I don't know how I let her go upstairs. I have no idea because she was, I wouldn't have put her up there. Huh. She's one of my best friends off the flight. <laughs> and then Chance. She, she went from possibly being killed. And when she got to the Presidio in California, her adoptive parents, once that adopted her, came to get their baby. And they said, we're sorry. Your child got killed in that plane crash. Oh. But in this next room, I thought every child in the airplane with me had two bracelets on, one with their adoptive parent and one with their Vietnamese name that they'd been fakely given. Uh -huh. But some of them only had one bracelet, and she only had one bracelet. And they put those kids in a room by themselves, and they said, you go in there and pick out anyone you want. Because so they weren't, they weren't they, spoken for. They weren't spoken for. So oh. the parents go in there, and they pick out Carrie. Her name is Knock Ann. She knows her name, N-G-O-C-A-N-H. And... Uh, they pick her out, and she was larger. They had no uh, children of their own. They adopted 11 children from 11 different countries in their lifetime. Oh, my God. That's how the family should go. They took her back to, Cal uh, to Los Angeles, Hollywood, to be an example. She lived next door, grew up next door to James Cameron and Catherine Grigsby that did the movie Titanic. Oh my gosh. She's worked in the movies as a video timer. She's beautiful. She she looks like an American. Um, I th we all think her mother, her grandmother got hooked up with a Frenchman when the French were there. It was a product of that. Mm -hmm. And then her mother got hooked up with another, this American guy. And Carrie came out beautiful. I mean, she looks like an American. Mm -hmm. um, one other story, well, how she found her father was she she did a DNA, 23andMe. Mm -hmm. She didn't find anything. One of her adoptive sisters was looking for her family, and she said, I think I found a link to you, Carrie. So Carrie followed up on it. She, like I say, we talk every day, and she said, uh, she said Ray, I, I haven't heard from her. I said, well, stop and think, Carrie, if you called up some stranger and said, I think you're kin to me, and I think your brother is my father or whatever, and uh, what are you going to do? You think it's some quack looking for money. And, well, what he had done, he had went and got a DNA test, mm -hmm. and he had ran all these tests and found out they were kin to each other. So she went back there, and she has a son named Brayton, B-R-A-Y-T-O-N. I said, I can, why would you name, why would you spell that name that way? She said, because my husband's great-great-grandfather was named Brayton, and that's the way he wanted to spell it. Well, when she went back there, her father had kept three diaries. He'd spent three tours in Vietnam. He kept a diary for each one. Well, she got that, but she was also looking through some pictures, and before he went in the Army, he worked for Brayton Construction Company, <laughs> spelled the same exact way. Oh, my gosh. Didn't it make the hair stand up on the back of your yeah. neck? <laughs> That's how that kid wound up that name. Oh my gosh! One other story I got to tell you. Okay. About that crash, it's humorous. <laughs> okay. In a way, it's sexist, I guess, too. But that morning we were loading every, all these airplane, all these kids on the airplane. There was this beautiful blonde. About she was turned out she was nineteen, and uh, she. Uh, was standing outside the airplane, bronzed, and had a baby on her hip. And she had a loose-fitting blouse with no bra, you know, and the sleeves were open, and, and all us guys were looking at her. And and uh, I just, I miscount, I miss, uh, I didn't know where she went. Well, she went upstairs with her baby, and she stayed up there. Mm -hmm. And she was, a, she was part of Big Brothers, Big Sisters, and uh, she was taking this, she was adopting this kid or taking care of it, bringing it to a family in the States, in Indiana, actually. And uh, she went upstairs and stayed. 
Well, I never saw her again until after the crash. And we were, I was out waiting through the swamp and I was looking for people and, you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I saw this lady coming toward me with a baby on her hip. And she walks up to me and she says, um, could you do me a favor? I said, what do you need? She said, would you put my ear back on? She hands me her ear in her hand. Oh. And I thought, well, okay. So I took my handkerchief out of my flight suit and I wiped down the side of her head, which is all bloody. And uh, <laughs> she, uh, uh, I put the ear back on. And the only thing on her ear was a, just the bottom of the lobe with a gold stud in it. The rest of her ear was in my hand, and it fit perfectly, like it had just been sliced off. And I found out later that it was barely hanging, and she had ripped it off. But it fit perfectly. I wrapped my handkerchief around, and she walked away. Well, about three days later, I'm walking down the hall in a hospital. I've been to some briefing or something, and in my flight suit, the elevator door opens. This person walks out of the elevator and got their head all wrapped up. And she walks straight to me and she says, remember me? I go, no. She said, you put my ear back on the other day. I said, oh, yeah, I do remember you. And then we were standing there talking. And she said, I was so embarrassed. I said, about what? She said, I was naked from the waist up. She said, my shirt got ripped off in the crash. Didn't see it. Mm -mm. I was in such a state of shock. Mm -hmm. All I saw was her and the baby. Didn't see her naked at all. Uh, and then she looked at my name and said, I think we're kin to each other. Her mother was a Snedeker. Turns out we're about fourth cousins. Oh, my gosh. So it's okay for me to look at her. <laughs> I'm from Kentucky. Okay? that's uh, We're cousins. <laughs> but anyway, we still get together, and she will not fly again. She flew home from, from there, from the hospital. And she lives in Spokane, Washington. She's a nurse. She travels by train everywhere she goes. Mm -hmm. And we spoke together about four years ago. And I, I knew she was in Tacoma. I called her and I brought her up on stage with me. And I try to do that when I'm speaking. I try to find out some of these kids are living there. And I plant them in the audience. And then I bring them up and it brings the house down. Oh, bad. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it brings the house down. Man. Thank you so much for coming in and You're talking to me. Welcome. and. Um, I, what? I, what can I say? <laughs> it's, uh, your story's just blown me away. Uh, it's amazing. But thank you. Very fortunate, man. Very fortunate in my life mm -hmm. to have experienced all the things I've got to do. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Again, thank, thank you. you.